Hello, welcome to today's mini lecture on calculus. Imagine you are on the hills. How difficult is reaching the top of a certain mountain? Can I do it? You may ask locals. The right answer is, it depends. A certain level of physical condition is certainly needed. Good boots, good maps, or somebody who knows the area are helpful. Of course, it depends on the route we choose. But we do not depend all on our feet. Those who cannot hike all the way can use cars or buses or trains, or funiculars or chairlifts. So there is a variety of options. The question for today's mini lecture on calculus is, how difficult is it to differentiate a certain function? The right answer is, it depends. It depends on the chosen function. It also depends on the route chosen. Doing it all by your own means applying the limit definition of the derivative and calculating the limit. But similar to the hill hiking analogy, there are also often some tools available. In some cases, one just needs advice what to do next at certain tricky points. This is quite similar to getting advice where to go, provided by a good map or a guide. We also have laws, limit laws, even elementary laws for differentiation. Depending on whether the law and the reason why it works is really understood by yourself, applying these laws is similar to taking a car, in which case it is just a convenience, but you could also walk the same way on the street, or taking a funicular or chairlift, in which case you cannot do it without. I will give hiking advice for six functions, f of x equals x squared, f of x equals square root of x, f of x equals x cubed, f of x equals cube root of x, f of x equals ln of x, or f of x equals e to the power of x. I will describe the hiking routes and will tell whether funiculars are needed, whether paths could be taken by car or bus, and where maps or guides are helpful or even necessary. Some of these functions you can differentiate by foot, some others you cannot. If not, I will describe which chairlifts, which laws are needed. Our first function, f of x equals x squared, can be done by most beginners by foot. All what is needed is a little basic algebra, advice where to go at some steps, and the rather intuitive law that for continuous functions the limit of g of x as x approaches a is equal to g of a, if g is defined for a. So we get f prime of x equals the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, as h approaches to zero. This is the definition of the derivative. Now we plug in the definition of f and get the limit of x plus h squared minus x squared divided by h. We expand the expression x plus h squared, we foil it and get x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. Now note that x squared vanishes in this expression in the numerator, so we get 2hx plus h squared divided by h. We factor the h in the numerator and get this expression here. Then we cancel the h and get 2x plus h, and finally we'll plug in h equals 0 and get just 2x. Our second example, f of x equals square root of x, which is x to the power of 1 half, is only slightly more complicated. The trick consists in raising the expression at some point conveniently, as I will explain below. It is easy to understand why the step is true, but not so easy why we want to take it. Here you just have to believe your maps or your guide. So again, we get f prime of x equals the limit of this quotient, by definition of the derivative. Then we plug in the definition of f and get the limit of square root of x plus h minus square root of x divided by h. Since we have radicals, we raise by the radical conjugate of the numerator, which is square root of x plus h plus square root of x. We get this expression, and we foil the numerator and simplify and get square root of x plus h squared minus square root of x squared on the top. Since the square of the square root simplifies, we get x plus h minus x on the top, and of course x vanishes and we get just h on the top. 
Now we cancel h again and get the limit of this expression here. We plug in h equals 0 and get 1 over square root of x plus square root of x, which is just 1 over 2 times square root of x, which is equal to 1 half x is above negative 1 half. Our third example, f of x equals x cubed, is done quite similar to the square function. We just need a little more effort when expanding. We start with the definition of the derivative. Then we plug in the definition of f. Now we expand the expression x plus h cubed. We get x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3x h squared plus h cubed by foiling twice. Now note that the x cubed vanishes and you get 3x squared h plus 3x h squared plus h cubed in the numerator. And we have a common factor of h, so we can factor the h and get h times 3x squared plus 3x h plus h squared in the numerator. Then we cancel the h and get the limit of 3x squared plus 3x h plus h squared as h approaches 0. Now note that both 3x h and h squared approach 0 as h approaches 0, so we just get 3x squared. So here we apply the product laws and the constant multiple law and the sum law for limits. The fourth example, f of x equals cube root of x, which is x to the power of one third, requires a rather sophisticated raising trick. So algebraically more difficult, this step is understandable, I hope. The difficulty is rather to know what to do and why when on your own. Though this route certainly requires a guide. Again, we start with the definition. f prime of x is the limit of this quotient. Then we plug in the definition of f and get this expression here. Now what? As usual, we have a quotient with both numerator and denominator approaching zero as h approaches zero. Now we use the difference of cubes equation a cubed minus b cubed equals a minus b times, open parenthesis, a squared plus ab plus b squared. For a equals cube root of x plus h and b equals cube root of x. If you raise the difference of the cube roots in the numerator by cube root of x plus h squared plus cube root of x plus h times cube root of x plus cube root of x squared, we get the difference of cubes of cube roots, cube root of x plus h cubed minus cube root of x cubed, which simplifies to x plus h minus x, which is equal to h. This is done in the numerator in the next five steps. So first we raise by this expression. Now we expand the numerator and get six terms, multiplying a binomial with a three-term polynomial. Four of these terms vanish. So what remains in the numerator is cube root of x plus h cubed minus cube root of x cubed. And cubes of cube roots can be simplified, of course. So we get x plus h minus x in the numerator. And the x vanishes. So all we get in the numerator is the h. In the denominator, we still have the h and the product of this expression by which we raised. Now, of course, the h can be cancelled. So we get the limit of 1 over this expression and since h approaches 0 we plug in h equals 0 and get 1 over cube root of x squared plus cube root of x times cube root of x plus cube root of x squared which is 1 over 3 times cube root of x squared which is just 1 third x to the power of negative 2 over 3. The remaining two examples both require a chairlift and a guide. The chairlift is the fact that the sequence 1 plus 1 over n has a limit as n approaches infinity and that this limit equals e. Actually, e can be defined this way. So all we need then is the existence of this limit. So we need to accept that the limit of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n equals e as n approaches infinity. This existence of the limit is usually shown by showing that the sequence is increasing and bounded and using a theorem stating that all sequences that are increasing and bounded 
converge to some limit. Okay, let's move to our fifth example f of x equals ln of x, the natural logarithm of x. Again, we use the definition of the derivative. We replace f by ln. Now note that the logarithm of a quotient equals the differences of the logarithms of numerator and denominator. So ln of x plus h minus ln of x can be replaced by ln of x plus h over x. x plus h over x can be replaced by 1 plus h over x, so we get the limit of ln 1 plus h over x divided by h as h approaches 0. Now here comes the trick. We define n equals x over h. For fixed x, h approaching 0 means n approaching infinity. Then h is equal to x over n, and the expression above equals the limit as n approaches infinity of ln of 1 plus 1 over n divided by x over n, replacing the h over x by 1 over n and replacing the h by x over n. Okay, a little easy algebra tells us that we can simplify this into this expression here. We pull the 1 over x out, essentially. Since 1 over x is independent of n, we can pull the 1 over x in front of the limit. This is one of the limit laws. And we also apply another law of logarithms. The n times ln of 1 plus 1 over n can be simplified into ln of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n. So here, the 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n already appears, which we have seen above, may be used. Now using continuity of the ln function, we can interchange the ln and the limit. So the limit of the ln is the ln of the limit. So we get this expression here. And now, of course, we apply that the limit of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n as n approaches infinity is just e. So we get 1 over x times ln of e. Of course, ln of e is just 1, so we get 1 over x. All right. The last example, f of x equals e to the power of x. Again, definition, replacing f. Now, of course, e to the power of x plus h is just e to the power of x times e to the power of h, so we can factor the e to the power of x in the numerator, and we get e to the power of x times e to the power of h minus 1 in the numerator. And since the e to the power of x does not depend on h, we can pull it in front of the limit, again using one of the limit laws. So we get this expression here. So the remaining question is, what is the limit of e to the power of h minus 1 over h as h approaches 0? Here we introduce a new variable n defined by n is equal to 1 over e to the power of h minus 1. That means that 1 over n is equal to e to the power of h minus 1, or 1 plus 1 over n is equal to e to the power of h, or h is equal to ln of 1 plus 1 over n. Again, this 1 plus 1 over n comes in. When h approaches 0 from right, n approaches infinity. When h approaches 0 from left, n approaches negative infinity. Let's now first assume that h is positive. So for positive h, we get the limit of e to the power of h minus 1 over h is equal to the limit of 1 over n divided by ln of 1 plus 1 over n as n approaches infinity. Now we can also rephrase this as the limit of 1 over n times ln of 1 plus 1 over n. And of course, n times ln of 1 plus 1 over n can be simplified again using laws of logarithm into ln of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n. So what we get is 1 over the limit of ln of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n. And again, by the same reason, since ln is continuous, we can interchange ln and the limit. So the limit of ln is the same as the ln of the limit. So we get 1 over ln of the limit of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n. And again, we have seen before, this limit approaches e. So we get 1 over ln of e, which obviously is equal to 1. So the limit of 
e to the power of h minus 1 divided by h as h approaches 0 from right is equal to 1. And the same reasoning can be done for the h approaching from left. So overall, we get that the derivative of this function f of x equals e to the power of x is just e to the power of x. I'm aware that this was a quite difficult tour today. Thanks for having joined me, and let's get some wrestling now.